There's an expression we often use in our everyday speech, uh, and that is the phrase eye-opener. Now, oftentimes we say, boy, this thing or that thing was a real eye-opener. Uh, th this truth or reality, you know, was there all the time, and I, I just didn't see it. Uh, for some reason, uh, it, it just took that difficult situation, maybe, that I went through to make me see it. I didn't see the truth before, but I see it now. In the scriptures, God often uses the word eyes in a figurative way as well. However, when God uses the word eyes in a figurative way, he isn't talking about seeing just any reality. He's talking about seeing spiritual realities. For example, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, in verses 22 and 23, the light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine, thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. In other words, the eye is like a gateway uh, into the mind and the soul. If your eye be single, in other words, uh, singly focused on Christ, then you'll be filled with spiritual light. But if your eye be focused on sinful things, then you are allowing spiritual darkness into your soul. Tragi tragically, that is the natural state of every person who's ever been born because we are all sinners by nature and by choice. Every single one of us is born into this world with an eye that is evil, an eye that recoils away from the light and gravitates toward darkness. It is in darkness. An unsaved person is blinded by his own sin and full of darkness, the Bible teaches. Uh, he cannot really see or understand spiritual truth even when he's exposed to it. And what's more, the God of this world, as God with a little g, uh, the God of this world, Satan, does all in his power to keep men in darkness. Jesus often described the condition of lost people by saying, having eyes, they see not. And that's why it's absolutely necessary that lost people's eyes be opened. In Acts chapter 26 and verse 18, Paul explained to King Agrippa that God's purpose for the Gentiles was to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God. An unsaved person is in complete darkness, and yet when a lost person responds to the gospel and repents and believes on Christ, his eyes are immediately opened. A floodgate of light suddenly rushes into that person's formerly blinded eyes, and the first thing that he sees is the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I'm not talking about actually seeing him physically in the flesh. Uh, what I mean is for the first time in that person's life, he sees Christ as his personal Lord and Savior. Spiritual truths which his blinded mind never comprehended before suddenly become as clear as noonday, and he wonders, man, why didn't I see that before? Why didn't I understand? But that's not where it stops. Every day of our Christian lives, there is more spiritual truth that God wants us to see. And that is why the Apostle Paul made a very specific request as he prayed to God for the Christians in the church of Ephesus. Let's look at this prayer request. Ephesians chapter 1 and verses 18 through 20. Ephesians 1 and verses 18 through 20. Starting in verse 18. He says, The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling, and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who to believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. This morning in Sunday school, if you were here, we, we read Paul's first prayer request to the, uh, for rather, the Ephesian believers. In verse 17, Paul prayed that the Father would give them the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Christ. The Holy Spirit is that spirit of wisdom and revelation. He is the believer's eye-opener. The spirit opens the truth of Scripture to us, and he gives us wisdom and revelation of God's truths. Uh, Paul prayed that the Holy Spirit would continually give them uh, wisdom and revelation. But now we come to verse 18. In this verse, we find Paul's second prayer request for the Ephesian believers. Paul's second request was that the eyes of their understanding would be enlightened. And particularly, Paul prayed that the Holy Spirit would enable them to see three extremely important spiritual realities that maybe they had not fully seen before. And this morning, we're going to examine those three parts of his prayer request. And so the title of this message, if you want to jot it down, is The Eyes of Your Understanding. The Eyes of Your Understanding. The first spiritual reality that Paul wanted the Ephesian Christians to see was the hope of the Father's calling, there in verse 18. I'll read it again. He says, The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope 
of his calling. I'm just going to stop there for now. One of the spiritual realities that the Lord wants you to understand is the hope of your calling. Now, I'm speaking to those of you who are saved, uh, that you may know the hope of your calling. When you really see and understand the hope of his calling, it will radically change the way that you live. Now, maybe you're thinking, well, that sounds great, Pastor, but what exactly is the hope of his calling? Uh, I'm a little fuzzy on that. Well, in a moment, we're going to look at some scriptures that will explain what, what this is. But first, there's something I want you to understand about the word hope itself. You know, hope, that's a good Bible word. Uh, in the New Testament, the word elpis, that is hope, it's used 54 times. And almost every time that it's used, it's used to describe the hope that a Christian has. Sadly, though, the word hope is greatly misused in our everyday speech. When people use the word hope in everyday speech today, they usually do not use it in the way that the Bible uses it. When people say, well, I hope that this thing or that thing will happen, what they really mean is, well, that's what I want to happen. Uh, that's what I wish to happen. I, I'm expecting maybe it'll happen, but I'm not absolutely sure that it'll happen. And there's, there's not absolutely certainty with that word hope, is there? Uh, however, that's not what uh, hope means when it's used in the Bible in reference to believers. The hope that the Christian possesses has no question mark attached to it. For the believer, there's no uncertainty in the word hope. If God has promised something, then it's a settled matter. Uh, though the fulfillment of that prophecy may be thousand years off in the future, it is as sure as if it's already done. God's promises are sure. For example, uh, let's look at a promise that God made to the house of David in the Old Testament. Let's look at Isaiah chapter 7. Keep your, your finger there in Ephesians. We'll, we'll be back to it. But if he, uh, Isaiah, rather, uh, chapter 7. And we'll start in verse 10. Right, Isaiah 7 and verse 10. Moreover, the Lord spake again unto Ahaz, that is Ahaz, the king of Judah at that time, saying, Ask thee a sign of the Lord thy God. Ask it in either the depth or in the height above. Now, this was a sign to confirm what God had told him, that it, that it would come to pass. He said that uh, the king of Syria and the king of northern Israel, they're not going to uh, overcome you. They're, they're going to be defeated. Uh, but verse 12 says, But Ahaz said, I, I will not ask, neither will I tempt the Lord. Well, it's a nice pious answer, isn't it? But the, f the fact is, he had no faith uh, to ask anything. He wasn't a believer. Verse 13, And he said, Hear ye now, O house of David, is it a small thing for you to weary men? But will ye weary my God also? Therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. You're saying, Okay, Ahaz, you've, you've, you've forfeited your chance for a sign. So I'm going to give you a sign. Uh, but particularly here, this was to the house of David, not to Ahaz particularly, it was to the house of David. He says, therefore, the Lord himself shall give you, all of you, in other words, a sign to the house of David. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. 700 years before Christ was born, God promised the house of David that one day a virgin would conceive and bear a son and call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Now, I'd like to take a very close look at those words in, in the original Hebrew. First of all, the Lord said, Hene ha'ama al-hara. This literally means, look, the virgin, pregnant. Uh, in English, we smooth this out as, behold, a virgin shall conceive. Uh, however, when you look at the simple phrase, the virgin, pregnant, uh, you see a powerful picture there. God isn't talking about a woman who was a virgin, but then lost her virginity and, and became pregnant. He, he's talking about a woman who is still a virgin and yet is pregnant. Uh, you know, what kind of sign would it be if a virgin lost her virginity and got pregnant? That wouldn't be a sign at all. That happens all the time. Uh, and so this is a sacred promise. God promised that a virgin would be pregnant. Uh, but that's not all. The Lord goes on to say, well, uh, This is translated into English as, and bear a son. Now, there's something fascinating about that verb, yoladeth. Uh, it is what's uh, called, it, it's in the perfect tense. Uh, in Hebrew, the perfect tense is used to express an action that is completed, uh, whether in reality or in the mind of the speaker. In other words, the speaker could be talking about something that has been completed in the past, or he could be talking about something that is still in the future, but in his mind, that thing is completed. That is the way that God is using this word, Yoladeth, here. 
Now, normally the word Yoladeth could be translated or would be translated bore a son in the past. In order for something to be completed, it had to have been accomplished in the past, right? Uh, of course, our, our King James translators realized that this was a prophecy of Christ's birth. And so they translated it in the future tense so that the reader would realize this was still uh, future when it was written here. But in God's mind, the virgin birth of his son is so certain that it was as though it were already done. God spoke of this miraculous event in the perfect tense as if it were an event that were already accomplished. That is how sure God's promises are. And by the way, that's just one example. You see that throughout the Old Testament where God speaks of a future event in the past tense as though it has already happened. We may see God's promises as future events, but God sees them as done. And that is why Paul says that all the promises of God in Him are yea, and in Him, amen. In other words, truth. Uh, Jesus Christ himself is called the Amen, the truth. Uh, he is also called the hope of glory. Christ is our hope. All his promises to us are true, and they are sure to be carried out. With this in mind, let's, let's see now what the hope of his calling is that we're reading about here in Ephesians. Let's go to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, and we'll read verses 28 through 30. Romans chapter 8 and verses 28 through 30. Paul says, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. According to these verses, what is the Father's calling? What has he called us to do? Well, he's called us to be holy. Uh, being holy is not a secondary matter to God. It is the whole reason that he saved us. He saved us so that we might have the ability to live holy lives. Before God created the world, he knew who would choose to receive him as Savior and who would not. And he predestinated those who he knew would choose to receive him to be conformed one day to the image of his Son. In other words, to be made completely holy, just like his Son, Jesus Christ. And, and this is your destiny, Christian. Your destiny is that one day you will be completely, utterly holy, without spot or wrinkle. Now, how can a dirty, rotten sinner who is bent on rebellion against God, be made fit for a perfect, holy place like heaven? Now, how can God call people who are unholy to be holy? Well, here's how he does it. Let's look again at Romans 8 and verse 30. Let's read that. He says, Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. How does God carry out his purpose? Well, Paul says that there are three steps here. First of all, God calls sinners to receive his gift of salvation. This call to salvation includes the call to uh, a life of holiness after salvation. So first there's the call. Secondly, he justifies those who respond to his call. This means that he imputes his son's perfect righteousness to their account. That's what the word justified means. It means uh, to, to, have, to be declared righteous. To have Christ's righteousness put on your account as though it were yours so that God can now accept you on the basis of Christ's righteousness. Not your own righteousness, but Christ's righteousness. Thirdly, God glorifies those who respond to the call. That word glorify is talking about the resurrection. When the scripture talks about our glorification, it's talking about our future bodily resurrection. Uh, we who know Christ have been given a, a body uh, sorry, will be given a body that has no more taint of sin or unrighteousness one day. It will be a body like Christ's resurrected body. By the way, you'll notice that the word glorified is in the past tense. Uh, in fact, all four of these words, predestinated, called, justified, glorified, uh, all of these are in the Greek aorist tense. This means that these things happen at a point in time in the past. Now, let's, let's take inventory, Christian. How many of these things have happened to us so far? Uh, have we been predestinated to be conformed to Christ's image? Yes, we have. That is past. Have we been called? Yes, we've been called. Uh, 
Have we been justified? Yes, we've been justified. Have we been glorified? No. The resurrection has not happened yet. Last time I checked anyway, it uh, hasn't happened. And yet in God's mind, we're already glorified. He speaks of it in the past tense. In God's mind, our resurrection is so sure that it is as though it has already happened as far as he's concerned. The Christian's calling is to be holy. But that calling will be ultimately fulfilled on the resurrection day. On the resurrection day, we also call it the rapture sometimes, we will be completely holy because we will have resurrected bodies that are just like Christ's resurrected body without sin. So what then is this hope of Christ's calling that we're reading about in Ephesians? Well, it's the absolute confidence that God will perform this promise. It's the sure expectation that we will one day receive glorified bodies. The hope of Christ's calling is founded on a bedrock promise, and that is why Paul referred to the rapture as the blessed hope. Let's look at Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2 and verses 11 through 13. Titus 2 and verse 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that, denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Everyone who is saved goes immediately to heaven after he dies. The Bible says that for the Christian to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. That is a wonderful hope for every believer. However, that is not the blessed hope that we're reading about here in Titus 2 and verse 13. The blessed hope here in Titus 2.13 is the hope that we will one day receive uh, a new body which is free of sin and fit to live in heaven with a holy God. On the day of the appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ in the clouds, that is when we will receive this new body. Christian, are your eyes enlightened to this truth? I, I'm not asking if you know it in your head. I'm asking, has this truth penetrated your heart? Do you really understand this? When you allow the Holy Spirit to enlighten your heart about this truth, it will radically affect the way that you live your life. When you really understand the hope of His calling, you will not be content to wait until the resurrection day to be free of sin. Now, of course, we're, we're never going to be totally free of sin because we'll, we'll still have the sin nature as long as we're in this body. However, if you are longing and yearning for the day when you'll be made completely holy, then you are going to strive to be holy now. That's going to be your desire. Uh, let's look at Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7. You know, in 1 John, uh, John said that, that every man that hath this hope purifieth himself. Talking about the hope of the resurrection and Christ appearing. And everyone that has this hope purifies himself, even as he, or Christ, is pure. Now let's look at what Paul says here in Romans 7, verse 24. He says, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind I myself serve the law of God. He's saying I, I, I've been given the mind of Christ the moment I was saved. I was given his mind, his ability to see things the way he does. With the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. And Paul is admitting, man, there is a battle in me every single day. I, I have the mind of Christ, but I also have that old sinful nature. And he's saying, oh, wretched man that I am. He couldn't wait uh, to uh, be rid of this old sinful body. Uh, the Apostle Paul did not have a casual attitude toward his sin. He hated it. Uh, he couldn't wait to be, to be rid of the old sin nature, the old sinful body. He couldn't wait for the resurrection day. Is this your desire, Christian? Uh, are the eyes of your understanding enlightened to this hope of his calling? that Paul's talking about here. Your attitude toward those pet sins in your life is a pretty good indication of whether your eyes are wide open to this truth or not. You know, you're talking, I'm talking about those little sins. You say, oh, nice little sin. You know, you, you pet it, you stroke it, and the, you, you don't get full hog into it, you know, but you, you know, well, uh, just kind of play with it a little bit. Is, is, is that the way it is in your life? Uh, if so, then your eyes are not wide open to the hope of his calling. Now, the second spiritual reality that Paul wanted the Ephesians to see was the riches of the glory of the Father's inheritance. Let's go back to Ephesians chapter 1 again, and we'll read verse 18. Ephesians 1 and verse 18. 
It says, The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling, and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Back in verse 11, Paul reminded the Ephesians about the believer's inheritance in Jesus Christ. But now he's talking about the Father's inheritance. Paul didn't say that he wanted them to know the riches of the glory of our inheritance or your inheritance. He said that he wanted them to know the riches of the glory of his inheritance. Now, maybe you're wondering what God's inheritance could possibly be. I mean, after all, God created everything. Everything belongs to him, right? If everything already belongs to him, how can any part of his creation come to him as an inheritance? Well, here's the situation. God created all things. And yet, there is a portion of his creation that has, in a sense, been delivered over to God's enemy, Satan. God permits Satan to have authority over it to a degree. Let's take a look at what Satan himself said about this in Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4 and verses 1 through 6. We're reading here about the temptation of Jesus when, when Satan tried to tempt Jesus when he was in the wilderness fasting. And starting in verse 1. It says, And Jesus, being full of uh, the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being forty days tempted of the devil. And in those days he did eat nothing, and when they were ended, he afterward hungered. And the devil said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, command the stone that it be made bread. And Jesus answered him, saying, It is written, The man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. And the devil, taking him up into a high mountain, showed unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said unto him, All this power will I give thee, and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me. And to whomsoever I will, I give it. Did you notice what Satan said about the kingdoms of this world? He said that the kingdoms of the world have been delivered unto him. When did this happen? Well, this happened in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve sinned. At that point, mankind was delivered unto Satan. Man who had been given dominion over the earth forfeited his dominion to Satan. In a certain sense, Satan received dominion over this earth and mankind. Uh, that is why Scripture calls Satan the God of this world, with a little g, and the prince of the power of the air. That's also why the Bible says that Satan takes lost people captive at his will. They belong to him. Whether they realize it or not, they belong to him. And that is why Paul said that God desires for lost people to be turned from the power of Satan unto God. The horrible truth is that until a person receives God's gift of salvation, he belongs to Satan. But pastor, you mean to tell me that the, the sweet little lady who lives down the street and always smiles and waves to me and makes cookies for me at Christmas time you know, belongs to Satan? Because she hasn't put her faith in Christ alone for salvation? Tragically, yes. But here's the good news. The good news is that Satan's power was broken when Christ died on the cross for our sins. Satan is a defeated enemy. Uh, his doom is sure. If you have received God's Son, uh, if you've repented of your sins, put your trust in Him, then you have been delivered back to the Father. That means that you are His inheritance. So you, you once belonged to Satan, now you belong to God. And that is why Paul called it uh, his inheritance, or God's inheritance, in the saints. The saints are his inheritance. You are his inheritance, Christian, if you know Christ as your Savior. You have been delivered to the Father, and he will come into his full inheritance of you when his Son appears in the clouds and gives you your glorified body. You are like a precious jewel to him, and one day he will gather up his jewels. Let's read about that. Malachi chapter 3. Malachi chapter 3. And verses 16 and 17. Malachi 3, 16 and 17. Then they that feared the Lord spake often one to another. And the Lord hearkened and heard it. And a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord and that thought upon his name. And they shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts, in that day when I make up my jewels and I will spare them. As a man spareth his own son that serveth him. Think of that. God calls believers his jewels. Every Christian is part of God's inheritance. But is there anything else? Does the Father have any other inheritance? Well, yes, he does. 
The rest of the Father's inheritance is the earth itself. When Christ returns to earth after the end of the tribulation, he'll cast Satan into the bottomless pit for a thousand years. And for a thousand years, he will rule from his throne in Mount Zion. And we who are saved will rule and reign with him. Think of that. God will actually allow us, undeserving as we are, to rule and reign with him in his inheritance of the earth. Christian, have your eyes, the eyes of your understanding, been lightened to this spiritual reality. Do you really understand just how much God values you as his inherited possession? He bought you back at a tremendous price. He gave all that he had to redeem you and to snatch you out of Satan's kingdom. If you like to cozy up to temptation and hang on to sinful habits, which you know grieve the Lord, you're causing great pain to him and to the heart of God. I would also ask this question. Have you been delivered back to God at all? In other words, have you been saved? Either you have been delivered back to God or you are still in Satan's kingdom. 1 John 5.12 says, He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. There's no in between. Either you have the Son and you have eternal life, or you don't have the Son and you don't have eternal life. Which is it for you? There's only one way to be translated from Satan's kingdom into God's kingdom. You must repent. That means to change your thinking. That, that, I'm not talking about penance. Uh, that's, that's the Catholic teaching, you know, that you, you punish yourself in some way to earn your salvation. That is not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches repentance. Repent means to change your mind, to change your thinking about your sin, to agree with God. Amen. I'm lost, and I can't save myself. My righteousness won't do it. I need Christ and His righteousness. And it means to, to desire to turn from your sin and to turn to Christ and say, I don't want my sin anymore. I don't want to be the ruler of my life anymore. I want Christ to become my ruler. The Bible says, repent ye and believe the gospel. The believe means to trust, to put your complete trust in what Christ did for you. Uh, and th that, that is uh, not just a head belief, but a heart belief, trusting in him with all your heart. If there's never been such a time in your life, won't you repent and believe on Jesus Christ today? The third spiritual reality that Paul wanted the Ephesians to see was the exceeding greatness of the Father's power in their lives. Let's go back to Ephesians chapter 1 again, and we'll read verses 19 and 20. Ephesians 1, 19 and 20. He says, And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. The third spiritual reality that Paul wanted the Ephesians to see was the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe. We often find ourselves saying or thinking, well, I, I, I can't do this thing that God wants me to do. It's, it's beyond my power. Serving God in this area of my life is so hard. And yet God says that he has given us the exceeding greatness of his power. Yeah, in your own power, you're not going to make it. But he has given us his power, the exceeding greatness of his power. In Christ, we have all the power that we need to live the Christian life. I can personally testify that anything that I have ever truly done for the Lord, the Lord is the one who gave me the power to do it. There was a time in my life when it didn't look possible that I'd ever be able to go to Ireland as a missionary because I was so deathly sick with ulcerative colitis at the time. Even my mission board, BIMI, when I, when I went down there uh, to... to uh, to uh, see if they would accept me as a candidate. Uh, they, they had some questions about whether I'd be able to make it overseas as a missionary because they, they knew people had this disease and, and they knew it was going to be extremely difficult. Uh, and and uh, they had to deliberate seriously as to whether or not to receive me as a candidate. Um, after I was received as a missionary with BIMI and, and I started deputation, it looked like I'd never be able to raise the support I needed. Number one, because of the, the health situation I was still going through and also... Uh, because I was single and I didn't have a wife and uh, that kind of makes it difficult uh, when you're, you're trying to uh, raise support. Uh, uh, but the Lord brought Katie into my life. Uh, he brought her along at the right time, right place when I was in a church. Uh, and uh, so the Lord met that need. Uh, but after the Lord brought Katie and me together and brought us to Ireland, we began the, the work of planting Redemption Baptist Church. It seemed like nobody was ever going to get saved. I mean, it's it so hard to... to, to get anybody to even listen, to consider the gospel. Uh, over the years, there have been many times of great discouragement because uh, of the hardness of people's hearts and the slowness of the work, and yet God has empowered us uh, every step of the way. If he had not continually encouraged our hearts and empowered us, 
we would have gone back to America a long time ago and thrown in the towel. Uh, and, and, and there would be people in Ireland who'd still be lost and on their way to hell. Christ gave us the power that we needed. Amen. Christian, the Father has provided you with all the power that you need for Christian living. It seems that Paul went out of his way to make this point. Verse 19 is packed with references to power. First of all, Paul speaks of the exceeding greatness of his power. That word power comes from the Greek word dunamis. Uh, we get our English word dynamite from that word. So it gives you a little bit of an idea there of the power that he's talking about. The next word, uh, power word here, is the word working. The working of his mighty power. Our English word working is translated from the Greek word energia. Of course, we get our word energy from that. Uh, the word, this word here emphasizes the actual operation of God's power. God's power isn't just theoretical. It's not just a theory here. It is constantly in operation in people's lives, and it's demonstrable. I mean, God's word gives us example after example of men and women who did great things through the working of the Holy Spirit in their lives. The next power word that, that Paul uses is the word mighty. The word mighty is translated from the word kratos. Uh, this word refers to power excited into action. Lastly, uh, we see the word power again uh, in the phrase, the working of his mighty power. Now, this is not the same Greek word that he used before, dunamis. He's using a different word this time. This time, he's using the word iskus. Uh, this word refers to possession or ability. Eskus refers to a strength that a person has, but which he may or may not actually use. You know, that's really the bottom line, isn't it? The issue is not whether we have the power to live the Christian life. The issue is whether we will use the power that we already have. It's available to us. All the power that you need is in the Holy Spirit, Christian. He lives within you. He's right there. But you must let him do his work. Um, if there's sin in your life, that you're hanging on to, and you're not submitting fully to him, he cannot work his power in you. If you're not praying and reading his word and communing with God, he cannot work his power in you. You have the power abiding in you in the person of the Holy Spirit, but you must submit to him. Many times we pray that God would give us more power as though we were a flashlight and the last battery that God put in us is dying and, and we need a new one. That's not the idea here. The truth is that the power source is always inside us. The Holy Spirit is our source of power, and His power never wanes. It never wears down. It's, 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 it's infinite. The only question is, is there something in my life that is hindering the Spirit from working His mighty power? David said, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. The power residing within the believer is exceeding great. How great is it? Well, uh, let's look at it this way. It is the same power by which the Father raised His Son from the dead. That's pretty powerful. We saw that there in verse 20. Yet if you think about it, Paul could have said, according to the working of His mighty power, which He wrought when He parted the Red Sea. That was a pretty powerful moment, wasn't it? When He pushed the... Can you imagine that and seeing that? That was, that was an incredible display of power. Paul could have said, according to the working of His mighty power, which He wrought when He made the sun and the moon to stand still. The whole cosmos came to a stop. Can you imagine that? He could have said, according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought when he made the sun go back 10 degrees uh, for King Hezekiah. He could have even said, according to the working of his power, which he wrought when he created all things. Why didn't Paul mention one of these stupendous miracles? Why did he say that Christ's resurrection power is the power that energizes the believer? After all, which is harder for God to do, to, to create the universe out of nothing or to raise Christ from the dead? Obviously, neither one of them is harder for God to do. Well, here's the answer. The reason that Paul was constantly talking about Christ's resurrection power in our lives is that Christ's resurrection is the basis upon which God was able to redeem us. God's creation of the universe, that wasn't the basis on which he was able to redeem us. The resurrection of his son from the dead is the basis on which he is able to redeem us and impart a new nature to us and to conform us to his image one day on the resurrection day. And that is why Paul said that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. God has spiritual truth that he wants you to understand, Krish. It's all right here. Do you see it? Are the eyes of your understanding being enlightened to the hope of his calling and the glory of the riches of his inheritance in the saints and to the exceeding greatness of his power in you? And again, I would also ask, as I close this morning, are you saved? 
If you're trying to get to heaven by your own righteousness, you won't make it. Salvation is a miracle of God. You can't save yourself any more than you could raise your body from the dead. Christ did raise himself from the dead. He said, I have power to lay it down. I have power to, to take it again. He raised himself from the dead. And by the same power, he can wash your sins away, give you spiritual life, declare you justified, and one day present you faultless before God with a perfect sinless body. If you're not saved, won't you let go of your own righteousness and put your faith in him today?